fun. Hey, the, the other week at home, um, I, I was uh, I was getting ready to log into the computer, and and we 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 don't share our passwords to our devices with children for obvious reasons. But I was messing with with Benjamin, and I was just like gave a pretend password as I was typing in, and it was like making fun of him a little bit while I was typing in. And he he looks at me, he goes, "Did uh, did you mean for me to know that?" He goes, maybe, maybe you should think about things before you do them. <laughs> That's got nothing to do with my message, but it's good advice. It's good advice. <laughs> hey, um, so uh, just as, as we get ready to jump into this message today, uh, just a, a mo- moment of transparency. Um, and when, when, I, when I prepare messages, I try to do my best to, to take uh, every, every time I open God's word and share it with other people very seriously. And uh, as I was preparing for for today's message, I felt I felt a, a special weight on this one. I felt a, a special struggle to it as well. And um, I, I share that because I, I wonder I, I wonder if God has something special for somebody today. In, in terms of um, we're, we're, we're going to be uh, tackling the, the passage of the Sermon on the Mount. If you've been following with us, we've just been going line by line through the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be tackling the, pa- the part of the message where it's dealing with the subject of, of adultery, divorce, and remarriage. And, and in, in our culture today, uh, divorce being so prevalent in our culture, there, there's not one of us that has not been affected by divorce. Even, even if you're not, even if you've never been divorced yourself, even if you're not a child of divorce, there's a good chance that it has touched you and affected you in some certain way. Um, I felt like there was a special weight and emphasis on this word today because, you know, um, I'd be willing to bet. I'd be willing to bet that God wants to maybe bring some healing, some closure for some people. I also believe that as we cast a vision for the importance of marriage and, and, and God's original intent for marriage. I, I, I believe not only do we do aftercare of, of healing and, and helping people go forward, but I also believe in doing preventative care as well. Uh, like, so, so, so many of you are, are on the front end of, of that. You're, you're, you're single, looking to get married, recently married, and we, we want to cast a, a strong vision for, for marriage uh, and, and, and show God's intent and design for it. And so normally uh, what I do is I, I share my main passage and then share supporting passages later. I'm going to do it in reverse today. So we're, we're going to get to Matthew 5 in a moment. Uh, but I, w- I want to start with, with, with a few passages just to kind of get us on page for, for God's intent and design for marriage. Hebrews 13.4 says this, Marriage is to be held in honor among all. The marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. You know, something that is very important about that passage, it says that marriage is to be held in honor by all. It didn't say marriage is to be held in honor by all people who are already married. It didn't say marriage should be held in honor by people who desire to be married. All of us. Whether, whether marriage is not on your radar at all, like I never want to do that, or, or, or whether marriage is a, is a tough, touchy subject uh, because of the past, marriage is to be held in honor among all and, and, and in a little bit here, we're going to sort of dive into some of the passages surrounding the subject of marriage. And marriage is as beautiful of a thing as it is just for that individual relationship. It's a bigger thing than just that individual relationship. In a little while, we're, we're going to look at creation. And we're going to look at the character and nature of God. And, and how... There's something about the union of marriage that replicates and images forth the character and nature of God. Marriage also is a living illustration and analogy of Christ and the church. So as important as marriage is to a household, as important as marriage is to the spouses, to the children, to the fabric of society, 
Marriage is also important because it images forth the character and nature of God. So when, when he says marriage is to be held in honor among all, whether you are married, desire to be married, don't desire to be married, where, wherever you find yourself on the spectrum of that, there, there, there's a reason why Hebrews commands us to honor it because it is part of imaging forth the character and nature of God. Now, one of the, the passages that you, you will often hear brought up as it pertains to the subject of divorce in Malachi 2.16, where God says, For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers the garment with wrong, the Lord of hosts, so take heed to your spirit and do not deal treacherously. One of the things I, I always want to point out about that particular passage is that that passage says that God hates divorce itself. It does not actually say there that God hates the divorcee. And that's, that's an important thing to hear because the next passage I want to show you, this is, is that God himself can identify with the situation of a divorcee. Jeremiah 38 says this, I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. Yet I saw her unfaithful sister Judah had no fear, and she also went out and committed adultery. So when I say that, that God hates divorce, but not necessarily does that passage say that he hates a divorce, God himself has experienced divorce. He, he says about Israel, I have written faithless Israel a certificate of divorce. In a moment, we're going to look at where that language certificate of divorce comes from. That's something from Deuteronomy when, when, he's, when the, Moses gave the law and the process in which divorces happen. He says, that, that thing that I told you in your marriages, your relationship, when, when there's an indecency that happens, that you are able to give a certificate of divorce. He goes, I, I, there, I have found this indecency among Israel. And I have divorced her. So God himself has experienced divorce. Now, you, you, you move forward into the passage of Hosea. You also see redemption in that very same story. I, I share these background passages as we approach our main passage today. Uh, once again, I, 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 I fully acknowledge that this is a touchy subject, right? Um, so my, my endeavor here today is to, to deal with the subject honestly yet sensitively. Uh, like I said, there's, there's not a one of us here that has not been affected one way or another about this subject. And, and so as, as, we, as we approach it, I, I, I want us to, to get God's heart for why he has this hatred towards the act of divorce, his heart towards uh, people who are going through the situation, also his, the, the, the bigger vision of honoring marriage. So, so let's, let's jump into our, our, our main passage. We technically have two main passages today. Both of them are in Matthew, so you can stick your finger in Matthew 19, but we're going to start in Matthew 5, uh, where, where we've been following along uh, in this passage. So we, we've, we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount. There, there are six antitheses that, that he goes through where he starts off saying, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. And he, and he, and he kind of is bringing a, a correction to the way they've heard things. And this passage is no different today. We'll see in a moment here that he, he gives what they have heard, and what they have heard is a partial quotation of the book of Deuteronomy. They've heard it out of context, and what Jesus is doing in this passage is bringing what they have heard out of their context and bringing it back into God's original context of Deuteronomy and the spirit of that law as well. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32 says this. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Matthew 19, we'll, we'll go ahead and read that one now as well. Matthew 19, verses 3 through 9 says this. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him, asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, have you not read? 
he who created from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And those two shall become one flesh. And so they are no longer one, no, no longer two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said, they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? And he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Let's pray. Father, we, we pray as we, as we wrestle with a, a passage today that, that could be very difficult. And, and it could be difficult in our understanding. It could be difficult in our experience. And by, I pray today that you would you would speak to us, you'd minister to us, you'd help us out in these situations. Bring healing, bring closure, bring health. And I, I pray for people who are on the, on the, on the front end of, of, of marriage and of life. God, I pray you bring resolve, bring conviction, bring, bring a desire to, to, to stay one flesh and stay committed. And we thank you for this today. Do an amazing work in us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Um, so Jesus here, he, he speaks to them, and he says, you, you have heard this said. And, and what he's quoting back to them that they've heard said is an in, incomplete quotation of, of Deuteronomy chapter 24. Um, they, they, they thought they could just, you know, divorce a woman for any cause if they gave a certificate of divorce. What's happening right there in this moment culturally, there were two different rabbinical schools of thought on this passage. The, the, there was one rabbinical school of thought, the, the Shemaiah rabbinical school of thought, that, that taught that, that indecency that was referred to in this passage was sexual immorality and sexual immorality alone. The, the other uh, rabbinical school of thought, the Hillel school of thought, they, they had a much broader interpretation of it. They, they f decided that indecency could be uh, if I didn't like the shape of her head, if she had a wart, if she burned my food. Uh, I, the, the list really goes on, and the longer I go on, the more it may trigger some of you. The longer I go on, the more we may look down our nose at them for their silliness and their reasons. But the reality is they had reasons, and we have something now called no-fault divorce. Well, we don't even need a reason. So their reasons might be silly, might be frivolous, might be trivial, but at least bare minimum they had some reasons. They were bad reasons. They were unbiblical reasons. And so this is where the, this tension you hear as the Pharisees come to them and, and they're asking him to, to validate their position on this. Which one is it? Is it the Shemaiah school or the Hillel school? Is it, is it just sexual immorality or is it, can we divorce for any reason that we come up with? And, and they were very, very focused on the legal aspect of it if I were to give a certificate of divorce. Now, you and I, as a modern hearer, we hear that as paper served. And, and it's, it's kind of that, but not really. See, in, in their culture, in the Old Testament culture in particular, um, adultery was punishable by death. And so if, if you saw a woman who you knew to be married beginning a new relationship, the assumption would be adultery the punishment would be death. And so the, the, the giving of a certificate wasn't just a legal document of serving papers. It was actually protection for this lady. Because as she left her marriage household and went back to her father's house, and, and then eventually maybe a new relationship began, this actually protected her from being murdered, for being stoned to death. And, and so he, they, but they, they were very focused on the if I serve the paper, if I give the certificate, I can divorce her for any reason. 
And, and you also, you, you will notice when Jesus is giving commentary on the current cultural situation in his day, you see him specifically speaking towards men divorcing women. However, in the, in the original, uh, the, the, the divorce could actually go either way. But by, by the time this school of thought came around of the many frivolous reasons somebody could divorce somebody, it, it was definitely male biased as far as divorcing women. So Jesus is speaking into this cultural situation while these Pharisees are overlooking the main thrust of the passage as they focus on the legal detail of giving a certificate. Let's go back for a moment and look at Deuteronomy 24 so we can actually see what, what, what it was that they were looking at, misquoting, all that sort of thing. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if she then finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. And she departs from his house. She must go and become another man's wife. The latter man, and the latter man also hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand, sends her out of his house. Or if the latter man dies who took her as his wife, then the former husband, so the first husband, who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife. After she has been defiled, this is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God has given you as for an inheritance. So th this word indecency, when an indecency is found, to hand that certificate, the, the word, it's not super clear what is meant by the indecency. The, this word uh, that is used here is only used one other time in, in the Old Testament uh, in the way it's used here, and, and it was... Uh, it was actually used in reference to human defecation. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not super clear what, what was meant here, but we, we can see that there, there was something uh, exceptional about what happened here. And, and if, if a certificate of divorce was given because of these exceptional reasons, then he's like, hey, dude, if you change your mind and try to remarry her later, um, you, you've already burnt that bridge. You've already found her indecent and sent her along your way. And, and so uh, G Jesus, by, like I said, by the time Jesus' day came around, like I said, half the Jews just took this, this unclear word and, and interpreted the word indecency however they liked, added all these extra thoughts to it. And, and they were divorcing for all these silly and frivolous reasons. And what, you, what ended up happening was, in Jesus' day, it left women in an incredibly vulnerable situation where, oh, you burned my food, that's an indecency, here's your certificate of divorce. And, and in that culture, she would have not had a lot of options left. So, so G, Jesus here is speaking in the situation, not only is he... Is he bringing correction to their misinterpretation, their misapplication of this? But he, he's also saying, hey, you're, you're putting people in an incredibly vulnerable situation. In fact, you're divorcing them. And what we'll find in a moment is you're putting them in a situation that puts them in a place of adultery. So I want to look at five main applications. I just went through and sort of gave explanation right off the bat. I want to look at five main applications from this real quick. And, and, and as we bring this application, I, uh, once again, I, I pray that wherever you find yourself at today, how this, this, this subject has affected you in the past, I pray that God does some tremendous work in, in us today. The, the very first application that, that, that we see in this is God's plan for marriage is one man and one woman until separated by death. One man, one woman, until separated from death. Jesus here, he goes back to original principles. He says, when, 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 he, when he is asked this question in, in, in Matthew chapter 19, he goes, he goes you, you know how it is. You, 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 you can read this yourself. That, that from the very beginning, he made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer uh, two, but one flesh. Whatever God has joined together, let no man separate. So, so God's ideal, God's plan for marriage is one man, one wife, till death do they part. Now, uh, an astute observer of the Old Testament may say, all right, you said one man and one woman. What about the cases where we see in the Old Testament where there was polygamy? And that's, that's a very real thing we have to look at in the Old Testament. There are times where some of the men of the Bible had more than one wife. Uh, I'll say, first of all, in the beginning, God created one man and one wife. 
And if it was his intention for polygamy, it would have made a whole lot more sense if his intention was for them to be fruitful and multiply to give Adam a bunch of wives so that he could multiply faster. But that wasn't his original intention. In fact, as you follow uh, the, the, the narratives of the people of the Old Testament who gave themselves to polygamy, oftentimes you find out it didn't work out real well. It caused way more problems, and so we also see that it's never really a thing where God said, this is an institution I'm putting in place. We, something else that, that this very principle, anytime I think about it and dwell on it for a moment, it really amazes me about the subject of marriage is this. Jesus going back to original principles and talking about marriage and talking about it in God's original intent, the pre-fallen state of man. When you think about almost anything that God instituted, it was a reaction and a response to the fall of man. You think about the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder. Why did he have to give that? Because people were murdering because of the fall of man. You know, any of his institutions, any of his laws that he instituted were a reaction to the fall of man. But marriage is something he instituted in God's original intent in the garden. It was a part of paradise. If, if you're with your spouse today, look at them and say, I'm a part of your paradise. That, that should have gotten a little bit of a bigger smile than that one. You, I, I'm, I'm going to turn around and pretend like I got it. Turn to your spouse and say, I'm a part of your paradise. All right, if you don't do that, your wife's going to be mad at you when you get home. I'm, I'm, t- I'm just telling you how it is. But original intent, God, God, God said, you know, I, I, I'm, I've created something. This is not a part of the fallen ma- nature. This isn't a response to fallen nature. A part of his original intent was man and wife marriage because it was a part of his imaging forth himself to creation. When, when he created man, he said, let us create mankind in our image. He created them both male and female. It's not as though one of us is the standard and the other is the substandard. It's not like men are created in God's image and women are like a lesser image or vice versa. The image of God is not complete until two become one. There is something that is expressed in men that is not expressed in women. There's something that's expressed in women that's not expressed in men. And it is not complete. The image of God is not complete until two become one. Marriage is, is, is part of God's original intent. This marriage is part of his design for mankind. Therefore, divorce is and should be a rare exception. But it is, is a breaking of God's original intent and plan. Uh, the, the next application that I see in these passages is this, is that sexual immorality is a biblical grounds for divorce. Uh, once again, we see something happening here, and this is a, a principle, a thread that we see that runs through the Bible. When, when, when sexual <coughs> union happens, two become one. <coughs> we, we see this mentioned here in, in, in Genesis. We see it reiterated by Jesus. <coughs> we, we see it reiterated by Paul. When, when Paul is talking to, to the Corinthians and saying, hey, if, if you join yourself to a prostitute, you become one flesh with her. And so there's, there's something that, that, that occurs when, when sexual union happens that, that binds two people together. And the reason why sexual immorality becomes grounds uh, for a bib, uh, biblical grounds for divorce is a bond is broken. Good job. You were looking out for me. Um, There's a bond that is broken when the adulterer joins themselves to another. The the reason why he's confronting these lesser reasons for divorce is the the bond was never broken because she burnt the food. The the bond wasn't broken because you didn't like the shape of her head or she grew a wart. The, the, these frivolous reasons. The, the bond is broken when the, there is a case of sexual immorality between two people. Now, the third application for this today is divorce and remarriage without biblical grounds equals adultery. See, when G, the people in Jesus' day were divorcing for less than biblical reasons, that bond had never been broken. Let me go back and just reread that verse. 
But I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That, that passage there is saying, if, if the original bond was never broken, if the, if the original bond is never broken, and, and you give her a certificate of divorce, and you send her on her way for one of these frivolous, unbiblical grounds for, for divorce, the, then, then the, the, the next marriage is the act of breaking that bond. Now, in, in their day, there was a necessity for, for a woman to be married. She, she was left, left in, a, in a situation where she didn't have many options, and so she's been put away for this frivolous reason. She now goes and finds a new man. He says, when you do that, sir, when you send her away for a reason less than the biblical grounds, you, you might be forcing her into a situation where she gets remarried. And when she gets remarried, you're forcing her into that adulterous situation. If, if there's no biblical grounds for divorce and, and she felt compelled into a new marriage, she would be, feel as though she was compelled into an act of adultery. Now, the fourth thing I, I want to show uh, principle here is reconciliation is possible. See, this passage, the Matthew 19 passage, the 1 Corinthians 7 passage, the Deuteronomy 34 passage, all of them permitted divorce but didn't command divorce. It, it didn't say, if someone commits adultery, you must divorce them. It says that it, it permits it, it allows it to happen if, it, 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 because of the brokenness, the breaking of that bond, the breaking of your heart. It, it makes sense. If, if you need to, you can. You've been released from the bond because of what they did. But our God is a God of reconciliation. Our God is a God of reconciliation. He says, in fact, because you and I have been reconciled to Christ, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In fact, you see Paul addressing this in 1 Corinthians 7 where he, he's saying, hey, if, 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 if someone wants to leave you but is willing to come back to you, the, the, the reconciliation is possible. Now, it's, through the gospel, God puts so many broken things back together. How many of you have that testimony in your life? God, through the gospel, he put something broken back together in you. There, 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 there was something dysfunctional. There was something that was off the original intent of God, that, that you had transgressed the law of God in some certain way. And through the gospel, you receive forgiveness and healing, and now you're back on track. The same principle can be applied to marriage. Well, once again, th this is not commanded. In the same way, divorce is not commanded. But it's possible. Reconciliation is possible. Uh, the fifth and final principle I want to show you that I, I see in these passages is this. Uh, th those who have committed adultery can and should repent. God forgives those who genuinely repent of their sin. It says that he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Oftentimes, we, we, we think that, all right, God can forgive me of these level one, level two, level three sins, but what about my level eight sin? What about this, this really horrible, heinous thing that I did this one time or, or repetitively done? And, uh, the Bible says that if we ask for forgiveness, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Well, I told you guys this before. That word all is my favorite Greek word. You, you guys remember what it means? All. <laughs> without, without exception. It, it, it's all unrighteousness. In fact, the Bible is, says that there's only one unforgivable sin, and that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So divorce is not that. And I also want to point out this. Where Jesus very poignantly said that the, the act of remarriage is this, this committing of adultery if the, if the biblical grounds had not been met. Though the initial act of remarriage without biblical grounds is an act of adultery, this is not necessarily saying that the new marriage 
is an act of perpetual adultery. When, if all of us, if given the chance, would go back and do th- things in our life differently. If, 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 we, if we could be given a time machine to go back and, and right various wrongs, invest in certain stocks, whatever, you, you, you'd go back and do things differently, right? You know, all of us would go back in time, but, but we can't. We can't go back in time. And sometimes we've, we've made, maybe this, this act of, of remarriage without biblical grounds and we, the initial act of it being adultery, that new marriage is not necessarily an act of perpetual adultery. This, this commandment does not tell us to say, oh, you messed up, so divorce her. And, and No, no. There's always a right time to do the right thing, and that right time is always now. Do the right thing now. Be faithful today. Be faithful in the future. You know, today, like I said in the very beginning of the message, I, I feel a, an, an extra a weight and emphasis on this message today. I think some of the things that we've discussed today could be speaking to former marriages, could be speaking to some present marriages, could be speaking to future marriages for those of you single ones who are looking forward to that day. The, the emphasis and the, the thrust of this passage about the importance God places on the subject of marriage the protection of innocent people. This thing that began this whole discussion of you've you've heard it said, but I say unto you, remember this began with Jesus saying, hey, those Pharisees that you know, if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God, your righteousness must exceed theirs. At that point in time, once again, they, they... had a low view of marriage. By, by the time they had embraced this divorce for any reason mentality, their, their view of marriage had became low. And because what we see Jesus do in Matthew 19, when he points it back to original intent, when he points it back to creation, when he points it back to the character and nature of God, if if our view of, if we have a low view of marriage, that's not just indicative of how we feel about marriage itself. If marriage, if the concept and the construct of marriage is something that is rooted in the character and nature of God, it actually has to do with a low view of the character and nature of God. And he says, come back to original intent come back to paradise where where mankind walked with God in the cool of the day, where he had open relationship with. And if you you get that, if you love God, if if you love your creator and, and identify fully as his creation, then you will walk faithfully as his creation, imaging forth his image by walking in union in marriage. And not only does Jesus point back to creation, but he points forward to he and his relationship he has towards the church. That that we are currently, we're described as the bride of Christ. Where we're at in the betrothal process right now is that we're engaged. We're engaged. And, and, and like a, a br- bride preparing herself for the wedding, like the groom who's preparing himself in a, in a place for his bride to live, our, our marriages and, and our core conviction of the importance and power of marriage not only points back to creation and the character and nature of God, but it points forward to the return of Christ. When he returns for his bride... 
and we'll be, we will be with him forevermore. Your, your belief, your imaging forth of marriage is vitally important, not just to your relationship. I don't want to underscore that. It, it, I, I don't want to take away from that. It definitely is important to your relationship. I want you guys to have healthy marriages, healthy relationships. But beyond that, it's, it's important to the earth that the sons and daughters of God would image forth something that the earth is groaning to see, and that's God himself. Image forth in his creation. So whereas this passage in, in, in Matthew that we, we, we spent time with today, it's a difficult one. It's one that oftentimes people skip. I didn't have that option because I'm preaching a message all the way through the Sermon on the Mount, right? That's one, that's one of the things I love about <laughs> this style of messages. We get to embrace all of the truth because we can't avoid it. Because that, that's what we're talking about next week because it's coming. But let me, let me just ask you to just personally, you don't have to respond to this, but just think about it. Yes, it's a difficult subject approach. It's, it's a sensitive subject approach. But when you see the magnitude of its importance, not just for your individual marriage, although it is, but for the imaging forth of God, the pointing forward to Christ's return, how vitally important it is for us to show forth in our, in our marriages, in our households, the union of God and man. Would you rather skip a passage like this just because it's difficult? Just because it touches a, a soft spot or it might, might touch a wound? Or, or would you rather em embrace the truth? Do it sensitively. Do it, do it in, 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 in a kind and, and humble way, obviously. But there's something about embracing the truth and saying, all right, God, how do you really feel about this? That's formational to who I am and who you are. That yet we can avoid hard truth, but sometimes avoiding hard truth is detrimental to ourselves. I, I, I guarantee you, if it, talking about this becomes preventative to someone else, being affected by divorce, I guarantee you anyone who's ever been affected by divorce, if they say, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy... I say, you know what, it might be difficult to hear this discussion. But I don't want my, my brother, my sister, to endure what I endured. So let, let's embrace hard truth. Let's deal with it for the sake of, of each other, for ourselves, for our marriages, for, for the image of God being seen by the lost. So today, as, as we close... Um, I just gonna ask the the band to return because uh, once again I, I fully acknowledge there's probably not one of us in the room who has been unaffected by this subject. What whether we ourselves have been divorced, whether we're a child of divorce, whether someone else's divorce has directly or indirectly affected our life. All of us have been touched by this. Whether we've contemplated divorce, whether we um, are, are walk, we're in the middle of walking through one right now, whether we're pursuing marriage, we're, we're in a dating engagement phase of life, and, and, and the, the, the idea of potential divorce is so terrifying as, as you move forward towards the goal of marriage, all of us have been affected by this in a multitude of ways. I, 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 can, I can say that confidently, not just because I know people in the room and I know our stories. I can say that confidently just based on stats. If I don't know you, I can almost assume that about you. It's affected you in one way or the other. I want us to take a moment today. And say, all right, Lord, the, the, the truth that I've heard from your word today about both 
how you feel about divorce, but also the fact, Lord, you've experienced this. You wrote Faithless Israel a bill of divorce. Years later through Hosea, there was redemption. He, he, he comes and, and says to faithless Israel, I, I will betroth you unto me in righteousness. If, if, if you're in a, in a, in a marriage where, where you need to embrace the process of reconciliation even, the Lord set the example for that. Earlier this week, uh, when 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 Audra forwarded the song to me on time, God, and asked me what I thought about it, and me knowing what I was about to share today, I was like, I, I I wonder, I wonder if that's prophetic for somebody's marriage today. Lord, I, I pray as we've as we've dealt with a a difficult and sensitive subject. Lord, I, I pray that I've I've handled it faithfully. I pray that for for those that that's a tender spot in, in their life, I pray that we, we handled it sensitively while handling it faithfully. God, I, I pray in, in these next few moments here as we commit ourselves to you afresh and anew, I pray today that for those who need preventative care, I pray this was preventative care. For those who need healing and restoration, they receive healing and restoration today. God, today I, with with a variety of experiences that are represented in a room like this. Some of us, as as I was putting out examples of how you may have been affected by divorce, you may have been just checking all of them off as I was going down the list. Yeah, I've been affected by all of them. Lord, I pray for the person who has been affected by divorce very directly in multiple ways. I pray today if if they were the affected party, that you bring healing to them. I pray if, if if anyone here today was the one who was breaking the bond, who may have committed the act of indecency and adultery, God, I, I pray that they give themselves to repentance and receive healing and forgiveness and can extend apologies and reconciliation where possible. take these next few moments and wait before you. I, I, I realize 
realize a message like this can be heavy, it can be sensitive, it can, it can be tough, God. I, I pray that we, that we look to you, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, the spies, and his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Or as we walk through the valley of shadow of death, as we, as we walk through pain, as we walk through sorrow, God, I pray that we lock our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. Walk towards healing. We thank you for that today in Jesus' name. I want, I want, I want to give you guys the opportunity just, just to, to get alone with God and, and respond to this how you will. Some some of you today, your 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 response to a message like this is it may, may be a completely internal response of of you praying and committing and 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 renewing your honor for the institution of marriage. Some of you um, conversations may need to ensue. Whether that's you sitting down with somebody to apologize or, 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 or sitting down with somebody and forgiving them. It, this may, conversations may ensue that might not be with somebody that's offended, but it may need to ensue with a counselor. But I pray in this, in this moment of response, you, you open yourself up to whatever direction God's given you to, to make sure you, you deal with any pain of the past and you do preventative care to be faithful and true in the future. You guys take next next little while here and, and, and spend it with God. I'm, I'll come back and I'll close formally in a, in a little while.